Oh, exciting. Okay, let's let's get started here. So we wanted to start with the land acknowledgement. Um, as our BPI team come from across the greater Vancouver, as well as the Halifax area, we would like to acknowledge that we are gathered today on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, Stolo, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, as well as the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq peoples. Um, we recognize this is a, a virtual landscape, so, and people are coming from across the world, so please um, include your own land acknowledgement in the chat if you feel comfortable. Um, and I also wanted to acknowledge my personal relationship with the land. Uh, I'm joining you here today as an uninvited guest on these traditional lands. I come from European settler ancestry, but I grew up on the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq peoples, which is known today as New Brunswick. So as maybe people are still joining us today, we will quickly run through the agenda. First, we're going to hear from our scientific director, Orlando, for a welcome and introduction. Then my colleagues and I will present our background research, which will be followed by presentations by our three esteemed speakers, Franklin Zambrano, Jason Finish, and Dr. Ching Shi Tu. Um, I, I just wanted to point out at this point that we had a bit of a speaker swap this morning. Um, we were expecting to have uh, Dr. Ronalds Gonzalez from NCSU, but we are excited and um, eager to welcome one of his colleagues, Franklin Zambrano, from representing NCSU today. Um, so just a bit of the logistics, we are going to take one question from the Q&A channel per speaker presentation, and then we will try and um, get to all your questions in the panel discussion at the end. So please use the Q&A channel um, and vote for questions that you want to hear the answers to. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Orlando. Wonderful, Kate. Thank you for very nice uh, acknowledgement and uh, welcome everybody today. Uh, I saw we have about uh, 100 people attending and this is really making us super happy. And uh, I would like to maybe very briefly introduce the Bioproducts Institute and how this event uh, came to happen. So we are in the University of uh, British Columbia, and uh, what you see is our mantra in the Bioproducts Institute. Uh, we want to unlock nature for a sustainable future. And I think uh, the case of WIPES is a very good example uh, in this endeavor. In BPI, we have a, a very important infrastructure and ac access to advanced instrumentation. UBC has made uh, tremendous uh, generational investments in this area, especially in forest uh, budget products. And this has resulted in, in UBC becoming a very high quality center uh, that can lead productivity and impact in this space. And uh, we think that that will position us among the very best in the world. So we have a lot of aspirations to go beyond the status quo. And in this slide, you can see a little bit about uh, um, where we're located in the Bioprocess Institute in the center, but we're surrounded by a number of uh, different uh, research and innovation centers uh, related to um, uh, biomass utilization, biorefining, life sciences. So it's very exciting, exciting to uh, work in this uh, ecosystem where we can uh, advance cross-disciplinary cross work. In the Bioproducts Institute uh, that uh, we launched uh, this year, we have a number of staff members and uh, I'm acting as a director, but we also are joined by Richard Sons, who is the Director of Partners Innovations, uh, Titi Shai Navesin, uh, who is Operations Director, Barbara Conway, uh, Grants Facilitator, Emily Gustafson, who is a Senior Research Project Manager, and Daisy Chen, Financial Coordinator. Uh, we have the additional members that you see in the bottom right, and I will introduce them as I tell a little bit more about the organization and how this event uh, is uh, uh, produced. But most importantly, beyond the infrastructure is the talent pool that we have in campus. And for that, uh, I should uh, share with you that we have about 40 professors affiliated with the BPI and the research groups. They are all very active in different areas of work. 
And we have uh, classified our um, uh, efforts in a number of different themes. Those uh, research themes are shown here. They go from biocatalytic transformation of an engineering of biomass, uh, renewable nanoparticles, uh, bio-based polymers and carbon materials, and biorefinery and biofuel systems. So we cover the whole spectrum from seeds to material development. But we also have recognized the importance of uh, looking into cross-cutting subjects, and that involves a social, economic, policy, regulatory, and environmental impacts. And for that reason here in this uh, panel that we have today, we also uh, have representatives from uh, these areas. So a little bit more about how this uh, came to be. Uh, early this year with the pandemic, uh, we started to look into our surroundings and it was uh, very um, easy to realize uh, the fate of um, many of the PPE that are in use. And that connects with eventually to the white wipe out event that we have today. So the motivation is really the increasing relevance of uh, single uh, use plastics during this uh, pandemic. And that includes not only the face masks that you see here, but also uh, wipes, especially those for instance that are used also com in combination with disinfectant uh, uh, lotions and otherwise. Um, usually consumers may not consider uh, the end of life of these materials and this is very important so there is a, a, a function for us here to educate in these topics so these materials are usually disposed uh, in the landfill or they go into the waterways uh, via the sewer system and this is really creating a major problem that is uh, now very uh, noticeable so at some point, as far as the uh, face masks, uh, the BPI came up with this uh, concept that is called the CAN mask that is still ongoing, but that connects very well with the, quest, with the case of uh, wipes that we are uh, discussing today. So there are very different aspects. Uh, first, uh, we need to have consumer education related to the growing problems associated with the use and disposal of uh, uh, single-use plastics, including masks, and including today, our point of discussion, the wet wipes. We also need to learn about the current status and the most uh, significant limitations and impacts, for instance, the end of life of these materials. And for that, we require a combination with a, a up-to-date market intelligence, because this aspect is also very uh, critical uh, in decision-making and into looking into solutions into the future. That is to find economically viable, uh, sustainable alternatives to replace either the face masks or in our case, uh, uh, wipes that are disposable. So in the Bioproducts Institute, uh, the people organizing this event, and I'm, this is what I feel the most proud of, is uh, this uh, group of uh, researchers, TILDA, uh, an application engineer in the BPI, Kelsey, another application engineer, Kate, who uh, already uh, in, was introducing this uh, seminar today, Tyler, and then Shivani. All of them uh, put together an effort and they actually came up with a very nice report that is called the Rising Cost and Opportunities of Disposable Wipes. And in that process, they interview a number of uh, important players in the business, and that uh, included international water services, a flushability group, uh, Sominin, a company in Finland that produces wipes, uh, also organizations in Metro Vancouver, and also people that are in charge of looking into uh, the end of life of materials, such as uh, regenerative waste labs. Also, they connected with the North Carolina State University in, in the group of uh, Ronald Gonzalez. And I know today we are joined by the graduate student seminar um, series. Uh, so they are watching this seminar uh, online from uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. So happy to welcome you all. And then finally, we have uh, Kelly. Kelly is the engagement coordinator in the BPI and she really uh, incentivized this group and help us to put the platform together. Now, before uh, I leave the floor to uh, Kate, back to Kate, uh, I want to briefly introduce the panelists. And we have here Franklin Zambrano, who is a last year PhD student in, in forest biomaterials in North Carolina, North Carolina State University. He, is a, uh, he has a graduate certification in non-wovens, science and technology, and he works in his research in hygiene, 
tissue uh, technology. Then from the industrial perspective, we are very happy to welcome Jason Finis, a CTO and executive vice president of uh, uh, Bast Fiber Technology there in uh, Victoria, uh, BC. He's a veteran with more than 30 years of experience in the area of hemp and bus fiber industry and brings an, an extensive experience in all aspects uh, of the value chain. So this is uh, really uh, very nice for, for, for us to incorporate the in industrial perspective. And finally, we have a Kinshi Tu, who is assistant professor in uh, wood science um, in the Faculty of Forestry in UBC. He works in industrial ecology and his research group is uh, centered around sustainability and bioeconomy bio research. He has a master's and PhD degrees in environmental engineering from University of Cincinnati, and he will be uh, tackling social aspects uh, related to uh, sustainability. So with that, I uh, leave the floor back to uh, Kate, who will start the first part of the presentation. Welcome, everybody. Yes, thank you very much, Orlando. Right. So I just wanted to thank Orlando um, for giving us that kind introduction. Um, as you can may already know, this our team here has written a review paper on the rising costs and opportunities of disposable wet wipes. Um, today, you will hear from myself as well as Kelsey and Tilda. Um, but we wanted to acknowledge our other team members, Tyler and Shivani. So in our presentation, I will outline the problem, talk a bit about the size and the scope, and then my colleagues will identify the three main sustainability challenges and some of the technical requirements needed to address those challenges. Now, as you're listening to our presentation and the rest of the presentations, we invite you to think about this question at the bottom. Is it possible to achieve a cost competitive, high performing biodegradable wet wipe? So let's outline the problem. I'm sure many of you have seen pictures like this before. Um, you may also have heard someone say that there will be more plastic than fish in the ocean by 2050. Um, but personally, I think that uh, underplays the problem. Recently, a study found that there are 8.3 million microplastic particles per cubic meter of ocean water. Now, as that kind of sinks in, you may be wondering why I'm talking about this. Well, the topic that we're here to discuss today, single-use wet wipes, are actually a type of single-use plastics, which can contribute to the microplastics problem in our environment. A study by BBC found that 90% of wet wipes contain some form of plastic, and currently all the wipes that we use end up either in a landfill, in the sewers, or in our natural environment. If I draw your attention to the image in the center, um, that's a picture of some wipes that were removed from a clogged sewer. All right, so since um, the wipes are made from plastic or other synthetic materials, they take a very long time to biodegrade into the, in the natural environment, which can leach microplastics. And before we move on, um, some of you might be wondering about this question, what are wipes made from? So wipes are made from fibers, which as I mentioned, could be synthetic, um, but they could also be natural. Um, and those fibers are held together by binders, which makes up the non-woven substrate. So you can think of that as kind of the dry wipe or tissue. And when that's placed in a lotion or cleaning liquid, that makes up a wet wipe. So a few numbers on the size of the problem. So as market report by Smithers projected that there will be 1.4 million tons of wet wipes consumed in 2020. Um, but this projection came prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Actually, this past summer, the Clorox company reported that they saw a 500% surge in demand for some of their disinfecting products. And now that we're getting near the end of the pandemic, hopefully, we're starting to see some projections go beyond. And we're seeing a projected annual growth rate for the wet wipes market between 10 and 18% for the next few years. Um, and that's almost double what it was before the pandemic, which was around 6%. Um, and on the right here, you can see the breakdown of the wet wipes market. Again, this was projected prior to the pandemic. So we're expecting the household wipe segment to take over a much larger share. Now, 
To understand the scope, our team has chosen to represent what we think the ideal wipe is with this green triangle. Um, and this triangle balances the cost effectiveness of the wipe, its performance, as well as its sustainability. And as Orlando mentioned, we had a lot of interviews with industry experts and did quite a bit of research into what the current products are in the market. And we decided that the status quo of the current wet wipes market looks a bit more like this red triangle. Um, so you can see that it is achieving quite well in terms of cost effectiveness. You can get down to even a couple of cents per wipe if you buy in bulk. Um, and they also perform quite well in terms of the strength, absorption, and softness. Um, but we were noticing that the sustainability point on the red triangle um, is quite a ways away from the ideal wipe in green. So we've identified three main sustainability challenges, and those are responsible consumption, the economic impact, as well as the environmental impact of wipes. Uh, Tilda is going to touch about those sustainability challenges shortly, um, but we do want to first identify some of the innovations in the emerging sustainable products that we've seen. Um, so these have come on the market quite recently and, and we're excited to see um, the market shifting in this way. You can see some examples of the sustainable, more sustainable baby wipes on the left-hand side. Um, and we chose to represent this new group of products by the blue triangle in the center. Um, so just a few things to note, you can see that the cost effectiveness has gone down as these are all considered to be pr premium wipes. And the performance has gone down a bit as well, not specifically on these products, but in talking to industry experts, uh, we've been made aware that using more natural fibers uh, tends to decrease the mechanical strength of the wipe. But one thing to notice is that you can see in the blue triangle, the sustainability point is getting a lot further away from the red triangle and closer to the green triangle, which is very exciting. Um, but it's still not quite there yet as there are not any labeling regulations currently that have to do with compostability, biodegradability, or flushability. And I'll pass it on to Tilda. Thank you, Kate. Um, so we've laid out a couple of the, th I guess, the three major sustainability challenges that we identified surrounding uh, wet wipes. So responsible consumption is the first, economic is the second, and environmental is the third. And I will now go into further detail on each of these. So responsible consumption is uh, around consumer perception. And uh, there are there's a consumer confusion around wipes and which wipes are uh, flushable and how to properly dispose of wipes. So there is a portion of the wipes market, single use wipes market that is labeled as flushable. And then there is a larger portion that is not flushable. And both of these wipes are used in uh, at the bathroom setting, which can cause confusion um, when consumers go to dispose of these wipes. There's also no regulation around labeling wipes as flushable. There are only guidelines that are made by the manufacturer associations. Um, a lot of effort has been made to uh, educate consumers on responsible flushing. Uh, the uh, close to home, I guess, is the Metro Vancouver has put out uh, uh, the, uh, the three P's campaign. Uh, so they uh, suggest and them and, and wastewater professional, professionals suggest that only the three P's should be flushed, even if a wipe is labeled as flushable. The next um, sustainability challenge we found is the economic challenge, which is really a hidden cost to consumers. It is, uh, it, we found that $250 million is spent annually in Canada to address sewer issues caused by wipes. Um, Metro Vancouver also found uh, that $100,000 every year is um, spent to unclog uh, regional pumping stations. And so this is the, the taxpayer's money that is going to um, unclog uh, pumping stations and pay for um, the upkeep of pumping stations that are are working um, overtime because wipes are being improperly flushed. Um, and then there's also the cost to personal property damage. Um, these wipes uh, can cause clogs in your in your home sewer system um, and you are responsible for for the cost of repairing and unclogging. 
The next sustainability challenge is the environmental challenge, which is um, in our eyes, the, the biggest challenge. So single, most single use wipes do contain, as Kate mentioned, at least 30% plastic. Flushable wipes, however, do not contain um, any plastic. Uh, and all wipes um, should end up in landfills, which is um, not ideal. Um, and if they're disposed of incorrectly, they end up in the natural environment, like our waterways and as litter. Um, and as Kate mentioned, wipes uh, can be a source of uh, microplastics in our waterways and will persist in the environment um, if, if they enter it. So prevention is the most feasible way to remove plastics uh, from the environment. Preventing inputs uh, at all stages of the product life cycle is essential in solving the plastics problem, which is why our focus is on creating a biodegradable wipe. I will now pass it on to Kelsey, who will talk about the technical properties of wet wipes. Great, thanks, Hilda. Um, so now that we understand both the nature and the scope of the problem, we can dive a little bit more into the technical details and understand, I guess, the basics, which will hopefully allow researchers to innovate and actually come up with a more sustainable material. Uh, I've outlined some of the key technical properties of wet wipes here. There are a couple others, but these are what we've identified as the most important. Um, so probably king amongst all the properties is the mechanical strength. Uh, so obviously when a consumer is using a wipe, they don't want it to fall apart in their hands. Uh, so the wet strength of the wipe when it's soaked in its lotion is probably the most important thing, um, particularly for wipes that are used in hygienic applications. Uh, consumers don't want any poke through. Um, so as you're cleaning your body or any sensitive surfaces, you obviously want the wipe to maintain its strength. Specifically in the case of flushable wipes, it's important that they uh, disperse rapidly and completely in a sewer system. Um, so that means that when you flush them, they have to fall apart into small pieces that won't cause clogs um, before they actually enter any, um, I guess, leave our home sewer system and enter the municipal sewer system um, where they encounter grates and things of that nature. Uh, so thirdly, the wipes have to be quite absorbent. So because they're a wet wipe, they're soaking in a liquid, uh, they have to hold on to that liquid quite well uh, without it sort of leaching into the, or pooling and leaching in the bottom of the container. Um, but you want the wipe to be able to release some of that liquid with mild pressure while you're using it just so it can actually achieve its application. Um, and then there are a number of other properties that are important depending on the specific application that a wipe is being used for. So things like how flexible the wipe is, how soft it is, if it produces pills or lint sort of as you're using it um, can also be important. All right, so Kate quickly went through this, but I'm gonna outline it in a little bit more detail. Um, so you can go to the next slide. All right, so wipes are made um, from fibers as was mentioned. Um, and this is probably the most important of the components uh, because the sort of type and the characteristics of the fiber ultimately determine the characteristics of the wipe. And because of this, it's in many wipes actually blends of different fiber types are used. So in non-flushable wipes, uh, you typically see a combination of natural cellulosic fibers uh, because cellulose is highly absorbent as a, as you might know that cellulose as a chemical is very hygroscopic, meaning it grabs onto water really well, uh, which makes it an absorbent material. Uh, however, these wipes also often contain non-renewable thermoplastics, A, because they're inexpensive, um, and B, because they're quite strong. And so these can be things like polyethylene terphthalate or polypropylene, um, and they have to be disposed of in a landfill rather than sort of a compostable, biodegradable way. Um, so, so, yeah, so for flushable wipes, it's because they're going to enter into the natural environment somehow um, through the sewer system into the waterways. Typically, they're made of mostly biodegradable materials. So usually, they're usually 100% cellulose. So about in a typical flushable wipe, about 70% of the cellulose is just regular modified cellulose. And the balance is a type of cellulose called regenerated cellulose or RC. Uh, that tip, so yeah, can, they're chemically identical or RC is chemically identical, identical to unmodified cellulose, um, but it's normally processed in order to sort of change the characteristics of the fibers and make them stronger. Uh, so it sort of takes the place of the thermoplastics in the wipe. Uh, there's a number of different processes that are used to regenerate cellulose. And so it's available under a number of different trade names. So the common ones in wipes you might've heard of are lyocell and viscose. Um, yeah, so the fibers, are actually bound, they have to be bound together into a web somehow, and this can be achieved through a number of methods. So either thermally, so you can sort of melt the fibers together um, chemically, so you can just add a chemical that will hold the fibers together or mechanically by defibrillating the fibers uh, by making them stick together that way. Uh, however, flushable wipes are sort of a special case of this where they use a specific type of chemical binder called a binding agent that actually allows it to be dispersible. Uh, so these binding agents are usually synthetic polymers that are ion or pH sensitive. So um, they essentially form strong bonds in conditions of high ionic strength or low pH. 
And then when you flush the wipe, the solution that it soaked in gets diluted, those bonds break, um, and the wipe can actually break apart into small pieces, which is which allows it to be flushable and for it to break apart in water. Um, however, because these binding agents are synthetic polymers, um, they're made out of typically non-removable feedstocks, and so a biodegradable bio-based alternative is needed if we're going to have a truly sustainable wipe. All right, so the third component is the lotion or the cleaning liquid or the solution that the wipe is soaked in, um, and there's a huge range of these that are out there just depending on what the wipe is being used for. Um, so just some examples here. So in the personal care segment, these are things that are being used typically on skin. So they're largely water-based and they contain ingredients like surfactants and moisturizers, also things like pH buffers, preservatives, that sort of thing. Um, and then in the household disinfecting wipe, these are largely alcohol-based, but they can also contain other disinfecting agents like chlorines or quaternary ammonium compounds. All right, so now that we sort of understand the sort of technical background of wipes, we wanna bring it back to our central question of today's webinar, which is, is it possible to achieve a cost competitive, high performing, um, and in our eyes, most importantly, biodegradable wet wipe. So Kate outlined our sort of triangle figures earlier, and we wanna sort of ask the question, how can we get from the status quo to our ideal wipe? Noting that we have seen um, some more sustainable products entering the market, um, but we wanna be able to have a wipe that achieves sort of the ideal case in terms of its cost effectiveness, its performance, as well as ideally in its sustainability. Uh, so to that end, in our research for our review paper, our team identified a number of different areas in which we're hoping to see innovation to get us from the status quo to the ideal. Uh, so one sort of group of these can be considered the white materials themselves. So we want wipes to be made out of natural bio-based biodegradable materials, um, both in terms of sort of the fibers, the binding agents, um, and how we can incorporate this in both non-flushable and flushable wipes. The second grouping is more on the human side of things. So as was mentioned previously, um, issues with regulations. Um, so sort of, I guess, forcing the manufacturers to agree on what should be labeled as flushable and not flushable and making sure that those labels are clear and visible to consumers, um, as well as consumer education and making sure that consumers know the proper way to dispose of their wipes. Uh, lastly, we can look at things like how the wipes are packaged and dispensed and how they're actually disposed of. Um, so most wipes are sold in plastic packaging. Um, and they have the sort of a consequence of the way they're dispensed is that they have to be quite strong. So can we innovate in that area to sort of reduce the environmental impact of wipes, um, as well as actually considering their end of life and how they're disposed of. Uh, so flushable wipes, we want to think of the liquid waste disposal and how can we make sure that when the wipe is entering the waterway, it's totally um, integrated into benign materials. Um, and then for non-flushable wipes, how can we avoid the landfill and actually make a compostable material, whether that's sort of composting in your backyard or in a municipal facility. All right, so with that, we're gonna wrap up this introduction. Uh, thank you for your attention and I'll pass it back to our moderator, Kate, to uh, move things forward. Thanks for listening. All right, thanks, Kelsey. Um, that was quite a quick background, but hopefully that gives you a bit of context and some questions to keep in mind. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I will pass it on to Franklin to bring up his presentation. All right, can you all see my presentation? Yeah, looks perfect. All right, perfect. Well, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity of being here. I'm very happy of, of uh, well, sharing the stage with you all. Um, Dr. Uh, Rojas asked us to put a presentation together on how sustainability is shaping the global hygiene industry. It's actually a very interesting topic. And uh, for that, we need to understand what are the driving forces pushing towards sustainability, especially in many sectors of our economy and for topic of interest today on wipes. So for that, this is the agenda for today's presentation. We'll start by understanding the wet white market where all again, these global mega trends like this uh, heat forces kind of pushing us towards uh, more sustainable solutions and how has the white market adopted the sustainability concept. But the market, the global market for wipes is a $16 billion market with only 900,000 tons. So these tell us the high price uh, or value on a ton of, of finished product. It's a market that's growing very quickly at a CAGR of 4.1% uh, globally. And in some regions as, such as Asia, as GDP and hygiene standards increase, there's a, a, even a, a higher CAGR 
5% for that region. Now, if we take a look at sales on a year over year basis, you see that it's um, the, the sales uh, performance for wipes uh, fluctuates a lot. And this is uh, also an indication that this is a very uh, competitive market. We have national brands, and then we also have private labels trying to, to kind of compete and still share for the national brands. So that's what kind of chips up and down sales. And here, uh, important point to highlight was the big increase in sales uh, in 2020 as a consequence of the of the pandemic. But is the the, the sales uh, or year is expected to level off as we uh, surpass the pandemic. Now, in terms of the of the market per se, this is a very uh, diverse market. There are many different categories. It's a very uh, segmented market. The, the one with the highest sales is the personal wipes, and it's followed by the home care wipes and, and floor cleaning. But now, if we look more into specific, there is an application almost for everything. There are really like a niche markets. We have cosmetic wipes, moist wipes, baby wipe, which is a traditional uh, segment. And so on. like there is a an, an industry trying to come up with different identify different niche markets where they can come up with a, an, a new application where a Y can actually uh, play play a role. Now we we might notice this, but wipes again as mentioned are everywhere. They go from makeup remover wipes, baby wipes, which are traditional, and also like cleaning wipes, such as clothes they want that we use for for cleaning and rubbing, scrubbing like a dirty surfaces. Um, and there are also very uh, neat uh, innovation ideas in the in the market. For instance, this is a, a wipe called Duke Wipe. This idea came up for a Shark Tank, and uh, since they introduced this wipe in the in the U.S. market, it is uh, right now one of the hot selling products at Walmart. Also, we kind of uh, forget about our furry friends. Here you have this type of applications where um, you have a wipe for uh, sanitizing the pop for puppies, but not only that, which is the obvious application, do you have also a wipe particularly for, for clean ears, uh, for, for instance, like cleaning the eyes. Um, also, the pandemic has had a big impact on the, on the wipes market. Um, companies such as uh, Lysol and uh, Kimberly Clark, they have been trying to reformulate their, their chemistry in the product so that these wipes are more effective at killing uh, viruses. And even they already advertised that the, the wipes that they have formulation is able to kill the COVID-19 virus. Now, interestingly, when we uh, think about the product on the shelf, this was a quick essay that we did where we went to supermarket, bought three different brands, and then uh, very interesting, what we buy from there uh, around 70% of the product, it's composed, it's just a uh, moisture. It's, it's uh, the, the clean solution, the liquid. And only 30% would correspond to the substrate. Now we pay for a case, maybe four or $5. And then we don't, what we don't realize is that when we take a look at the dollar per, per metric ton of this type of, of substrate, we're going or paying, it goes anywhere from $40,000 um, dollars all the way up to almost seventy thousand dollars so what this is showing us that there's uh, in huge very huge margins with raw materials representing around four thousand dollars a ton so what this is telling us is that industry is going to keep pushing to identify markets or, or different niches where they can um, come up with an application or try to to increase their production now, in terms of global megatrends, uh, as mentioned, so there are uh, different um, aspects are, are changing the way how uh, our world works right now, how industry conducts conduct business. In that regard, sustainability is one uh, major aspect. This push for a more uh, circular economy and also of interest um, for us today that there are also changes in social behavior that are closely related to, to the sustainable uh, approach. In that regard, uh, we have all heard about uh, millennials, Generation Z, and uh, it's been determined that right now, one third of the US population is composed of millennial. And interestingly, they have a, a pretty good amount of disposable income. That means that they have right now the power to sort of determine how, what they want to, to buy and what they're looking for in, in, the, in their products. So one uh, characteristic of millennials is that they have uh, information at their fingertips. So, um, when they want to buy a product before buying it, they want to uh, they would typically like research on the internet, let, uh, take a look at reviews. They want to share the experience, and also important, they want the highest value for their money. 
So uh, this is uh, actually kind of that uh, like uh, producers kind of longer trick um, consumers because they know what they're buying because they, they do research. And more uh, importantly, they uh, want to be ethically responsible. They care about the environment and uh, research that we've performed here at the at NC State uh, on hygiene tissue um, products. Uh, have shown that uh, actually consumers are willing to pay up to 50% for, for products that are uh, labeled as sustainable. Now, the issue with this is that when it comes to consumers and products, sustainability metrics are not really clear. And here I brought a couple of examples for, for uh, tissue uh, paper. For instance, sustainability can be advertised as uh, a product that was produced by avoiding harsh chemicals and reduced water. Also a product that was uh, produced using uh, uh, a non-woody biomass, such as non-wood, uh, such as bamboo, for instance. Also, we've seen a uh, cordless tissue or also uh, paper packaging. And what's, what's uh, tricky here is that uh, consumers, uh, when they go to, to, to a shelf and then they're staring in front of the product, like they don't really know, uh, they, they can be confused about what sustainability means. There is not a clear metric and, and on a, a quantitative uh, aspect. So what we envision is that so right now, companies are actually uh, make money or profiting on sustainability. But what we envision is that five years, four years from now, we'll be able to go into a supermarket, take our phone, scan the product, and then actually see, for instance, the amount of kilograms of CO2 that were associated with the production of that product. And then that's where the industry is going to move towards. Now, in terms of uh, what's on the shelf, there are already uh, big companies such as Kimberly Clark. They are uh, producing uh, fossil wipes that are 100% plastic free and biodegradable. And then there are different ways how different companies have uh, trying to address or tackle the sustainability in, in, in wipes. For instance, uh, one important aspect is the, the material selection. They're moving towards uh, bio-based alternatives, such as, for instance, hemp, uh, canaf, jute, uh, and also ingredients that was surfactants and they, they uh, put in there the, the, the alcohol solutions that they use for, for the cleaning solutions. Another important aspect is the, the, um, the sourcing of their materials, recyclability and the bioavailability. For instance, uh, there is a, a new business model where you keep the, the package, but then you, you replace, you only uh, replace the, the, the wipes or there are also uh, sustainable uh, biodegradable packaging here in this picture. But one thing that we need to uh, realize in terms of, of developing a product that's high performing, that is sustainable, is that uh, for some particular applications, we need the plastic component there to keep performance. For instance, uh, in applications where you need a really high level of mechanical strength, uh, when you're, for instance, like rubbing or scrubbing a, a surface. So that, uh, again, brings us to the, to the initial question that, that's the center of this uh, webinar today to develop this why that's biodegradable, high uh, lead performance, and it's also uh, sustainable. Thank you. Awesome, thanks, Franklin. Um, I guess I have a question for you, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you talked about the millennials and how a lot of people are willing to pay kind of the price premium for sustainability or more sustainable products. Mm -hmm. um, but have you, have you done any work in the area of, um, in terms of policy or working with industry to see how you can drive down the price point so that it is affordable for people of all income levels? So what we've done is uh, we've uh, done extensive work on the on hygiene tissue products. And then uh, we have uh, ongoing research in, in that regard. And then we've identified that uh, right now, sustainable products are, uh, they represent a, a really a small uh, market share, uh, but then they have the, this very high price premium. And then what we've seen is that uh, companies, so these are uh, in general, like very small companies. Now what we've seen is that big players, I'm talking about like Kimberly Clark, PNG, they're trying to realize the importance of sustainability. And then we have uh, different type of conversations with this um, like big industries and they, they're trying to understand how they can uh, join this market. So I guess that now that we have really the major players uh, there like sitting on tables where like this, this other, like we need the like policy makers and all of these uh, people coming in uh, uh, to, to see if we can uh, somehow reduce the price point for this type of, of, of uh, sustainable products. Awesome, thanks. 
to make more and more price competitive. Yeah, that's awesome. It's good to hear that um, some of those big companies are, are going to be joining. Um, I guess now we will uh, turn it over to Jason. Uh, Franklin, I, I'd ask to stop sharing your screen if that's possible. Great, <clears throat> and I will share mine. There we go. <clears throat> that's coming through loud and clear. Oh, thumbs up from everyone. Perfect. Great. Well, thanks very much for uh, the invitation to talk today. I'm, I'm excited. I think the question that's been asked to the uh, attendees and to the group is a high performing, low cost, completely biodegradable wipe possible. Now, I don't want to give the way the ending of my presentation too early, but I'm going to go on record and say yes, and not anytime in the future. It's, it's available to us all now. But before we get to talking about the future, I think we need to understand how these uh, fibers, now obviously with Bast Fiber Technologies, we are a Bast Fiber company. We specialize in hemp, flax, jute, canaf, you name it, that's our, that's our uh, area of, of interest. But on this opening slide, <clears throat> you'll see a, a group of archeologists in a cave in Georgia, which is the country, not the state, uh, unearthing uh, uh, flax fibers that are 34,000 years old. And these fibers were used back then by these early humans for clothing, for basket weaving, for uh, creating thread to sew their clothes, for a number of uses. And basically what, what, what we're doing is we're recognizing what they recognize, which is an opportunity in these fibers to uh, help us. And uh, we'll go so far as to say that these ancient fibers can help immediately transition us out of synthetic fibers in the global single use plastic uh, industry. So my presentation today is going to be centered around the factors that are required uh, for natural fibers to gain a foothold in the, in the global non-woven industry. This is a transition uh, that many people are talking about, but in order for it to be successful, we need to make sure that the transition to a natural solution is both cost-effective and can deliver superior performance. That's been a, a common theme uh, in the presentation so far. So I have uh, six or seven slides to go through, um, starting with the agronomics. Now, obviously we're not making these, these fibers in a lab. We rely on farmers to grow them annually. So we need to make sure that farmers are willing and able to grow these crops. And I can, I can assure you that they are, they're ready, willing and able. Um, bass fiber crops have a reputation amongst farmers as being relatively simple to grow and with a regenerative nature that actually can help improve the yield of the following year's crop. Uh, specifically, when we're talking in Canada, we're talking about cereal straws. So they have a, of a great, great way of preparing the soil for next year's crop. Now, in North America, we, we pretty much operate on a four-year uh, crop rotation cycle. And by that, what happens is that we have three years where crops are growing on land. The fourth year, the land is fallow or sits still. It's not, not cultivated. Now, if we were to grow bass fiber crops on those fallow acres every year, we could annually produce enough natural fiber to displace 50% of the plastic used in the single use non-woven category. And that comes with no, uh, no displacement of food. Uh, unlike PLA or, or the corn based fibers, we're not displacing a food crop. We're also not uh, leading to the destruction of natural habitats. Because as we all know, in this industry right now, plastic reigns supreme, at least as far as uh, volume of use. With the, uh, the, the push away from plastic, that is a, it leads to an obvious question of where's that volume going to go? And typically it goes to viscose, it goes to lyocell. Uh, these are the next uh, up and coming fibers. Now with the volume of plastic that's about to be displaced, there isn't enough wood coming from well-managed forests in the world to satisfy that demand. So it's inevitable that deforestation, loss of habitat, that's going to happen as a result of the increased demand. So where we source our fibers, <clears throat> they come as a co-product of an existing industry. So it could be from the linen industry in Europe. It could be from the seed industry here in Canada or elsewhere. Uh, it can also come from the CBD industry where the stocks are typically waste. Now, once you have a fiber, you have to make sure that it will run. And by run, I mean as well as plastic. And the, the, the thing that we need to realize is that the non-woven conversion lines have been developed for plastic and plastic fibers, synthetic fibers are and regenerated uh, cellulose are all extremely consistent. 
They're all the same length. They behave exactly the same, whether it's uh, from this year or next year, it doesn't depend on crop or mother nature. So the, the focus of our company over the past five years has been to optimize our natural fibers to run on these platforms without the use of chemical binders. So for example, uh, in a spun lay system, the fibers are bound together only by high pressure water jets. Uh, in needle punch, it's bound together by needles. And in wet laid, we use pulp and bass fibers, no chemical bonding. So as you can see on our, on our bottom right picture, you can see that our fibers are individualized. They're very clean and they're completely free of contamination. So what we've, what we've been able to develop is a plug and play solution for the non-woven conversion industry. You can re remove a bale of polyester, replace it with a bale of our bass fibers, and those machines will run at the same efficiency, at the same commercial speeds, and produce fabrics that meet or exceed all of the technical requirements, whether that's the technical requirements of the non-woven converters or by the uh, consumers or the brands that are using these for the wiping applications. Then of course you need consumers and, and uh, this has been touched on previously, but in the last uh, trade show I was able to attend pre-COVID, that was the end of uh, 2019. Um, and it was the INDA, which is the North American uh, non-woven industry group. There was a presentation given at that uh, show highlighting consumers willingness to look and support, look for and support sustainable options when it comes to plastic free wipes. So in the table on the left, you have natural face, facial wipes, which would be cosmetic face removers, it could be personal care wipes. These things, these types of wipes are a little bit more expensive to begin with, but even the price conscious consumers are willing to pay about 9% more. On the right-hand side, we have the surface cleaning wipes, which you might use in a kitchen or in your bathroom. They're lower costs to begin with, and the price hawks, the most uh, sensitive to price, but still wanting to support, are willing to pay up to 26% more for those wipes. <clears throat> Now we've done the comparison. And if you compare a package of wet wipes made from our bast fibers next to a package of wet wipes made from plastic, you'll find that our wet wipes will command a price premium of about four to 8% per package, which is well within consumer's tolerance. But when you start to consider the extended uh, uh, producer responsibility schemes that are coming into Europe where basically uh, the use of plastic is being taxed or fined uh, by the end user, that increases the price of the plastic wipes, the synthetic uh, wet wipes, to the point where our bast fiber wipes are two to 3% cheaper than the plastic alternative. So there's no resistance from a price perspective. Now the industry is willing and they are chomping at the bit to transition their supply chains away from plastic. So the biggest companies in the world our biggest brands with Kimberly Clark, Procter and Gamble, Clorox, Unilever and Reckitt, they've all signed the treaty to move their supply chains to plastic free, uh, especially in the single use categories. Now, some of them have set very aggressive goals saying by 2025, they expect their supply chains to be single plastic free. Um, others are saying it's gonna be between 2025 to 2030. But regardless of when the change happens, the change is happening and it's imminent. So these companies are desperately looking for natural fiber alternatives that can produce that high performing, low cost, completely biodegradable wipe now, not in 20 years from now. They, they need these, these fibers now. Now from, from a company like us, a, a startup clean tech company, we were a startup uh, um, about five years ago, relying on investors to help us get this going. And, We've been fortunate because investors have shown an increasing willingness to support clean tech um, businesses like ours. If you have a company that's out there uh, starting to look for plastic alternatives or alternative energy or uh, alternative packaging, you, you have a willing market. You have a, a willing set of ears from the investment community looking to support this. Um, as the quote says, climate risk is investment risk. And so by being able to be a clean tech company, we can show that uh, uh, we can reduce the investment risk on that, on that uh, behalf. So in our own company, we just recently uh, closed a, a major financing. <clears throat> and I'm pleased to say that 75% of our shareholders, uh, it, of our current shareholders participated in that raise, which is fantastic. And we're, we're very, uh, very pleased to have the, the level of support that we do. 
Um, we also have uh, excellent support coming from IRAP, which is uh, the investment or industrial research uh, and design program here in Canada. And what I can tell you is that the funds that we've raised are earmarked specifically for commercializing our, our fibers in 2021. The development work has been done. We are ready to move forward. And uh, uh, we now have the support we need financially to be able to bring our products to market this year. Now, this is where governments need to get involved. And the European Union is leading the way on single use plastic directives. Uh, they have come out with their extended producer responsibility scheme, which essentially uh, will fine uh, the use of plastic um, and pretty much bring plastic and natural fibers onto a level playing field. They've gone further than that, though, and they are actually starting to um, require that plastic white packages are, are labeled as plastic. So, you know, kind of like the warnings that you see on a cigarette package, these are little plastic labels saying, hey, consumer, be careful, you're buying a plastic product. This, even though it's soft and feels nice against your skin, it's, it's basically a plastic bag. So be warned. Now in, in Canada, we have some excellent um, goals. Our, our stated goal from the government is that by 2030, we will be single pl uh, use plastic free. But I'm, I'm afraid that the, the, the introduction, introduction of this legislation is happening in baby steps and we have a long way to go to reach that. And I think that there's an overemphasis on recycling um, the majority of plastic, I think the statistic is that more than 90% of the plastic uh, produced is never recycled. So, you know, you look at, at um, the circular economy, which is reduce, reuse and recycle. There's a, there's a break between the using and the recycling. It, it typically doesn't happen. And it's a moot point in these single use products anyway, from a hygienic perspective or uh, other single use items, they can't be recycled. So, our, our uh, position is that we need to move away from that first uh, iteration of the circular economy and move into what we call replace and repair. So by replace, I mean replace the plastic at source. Don't put it in the products to begin with. And at the end of the useful life of that product or the wipe, return it to the ground where the carbon is released back into the soil uh, to support the, the growth of the next year's crops. And uh, that's the circular economy 2.0, as we call it. Now, performance. Typically, uh, you know, and historically, the uh, consumer has been asked to forgive a little bit of performance in favor of environmental stewardship. And so the question that you've asked and that we ask is, can a sustainable wipe have better performance? And the answer is yes, 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 and yes. No question. Um, and to answer this, I, I always make the people here laugh a little bit because uh, I, I rely on my grade 10 botany to be able to help uh, make the point about why do these fibers perform well. So phloem fibers are the fibers that run up and down the stem of these plants and their job in nature is to transport moisture. So sap that's produced out of photosynthesis travels down these phloem fibers to, uh, to uh, feed the plant and to, to keep it nourished. Now, because we don't pulp our fibers, we, they're not regenerated the phloem fiber and the moisture management characteristics that it has translates directly into the wet wipe. So we are able to boast faster absorption, excellent wet strength, better moisture release, and lower stratification. <clears throat> and those are all very, very important aspects when you're talking about uh, wet wipes. I can talk about um, machine direction and cross-direction strength. I can talk about uniformity, and I can say that we've run a number of trials and number of commercial productions showing that we have no issue uh, for whatever type of uh, box the wet wipes are gonna be put in and pulled out of to make sure that they don't have too much elongation, make sure that they perform the way they're supposed to, uh, we can meet those metrics. So the transition to a natural solution <clears throat> is cost effective, uh, we can deliver superior performance, and we can create a new industry for Canada right now. Uh, it's, there's, there's really no more excuse. We have everything we need to get started and to make this transition a reality. Um, the last slide I'm going to leave you with today is just a, a snapshot of our pre-COVID uh, use of non-wovens in Canada. And these, these numbers come from the most recently available Industry Canada statistics that show that we have a $500 million trade deficit uh, when it comes to non-woven fabric. And 
our opinion is that with businesses working in conjunction with academia, with the support of the government, we have everything we need to turn that trade deficit into a $500 million trade surplus. We can do this at home. Uh, leveraging our agricultural expertise, our supply chain expertise in Canada, and our access to markets, everything we need is here. So the future is now. We are able to accomplish this goal and produce a high-performing, low-cost, completely biodegradable, and I would say compostable, wipe today. And that's the last slide I have. You can scan my QR code if you'd like my contact details, um, and we'll go back to the future. Oh, we, we love the puns here at BPI, yeah. Jason. Thank, Thank you, you for that. Yep, you're welcome. Um, so just a quick question before we move on to our next presenter. Um, this is a question from Rob that I also kind of wanted to build on. So he asked, are you suggesting that vast fibers can also replace things like viscose, et cetera? So I guess we're wondering, um, is this kind of a, are vast fibers a drop-in solution for cellulose or regenerated yep. cellulose or are you using blends? Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, the, the focus of this, of this uh, seminar is on synthetics, um, but under the European Union's uh, single-use plastic directive, the guidelines are that viscose is also considered a plastic. <clears throat> and that may change, but as of right now, that is the guidance coming out of Europe. So we are absolutely a plastic or regenerated cellulose replacement. Um, we are able to run our fibers from a minority blend whether we're blending with any, whatever, cotton to uh, polyester to, to viscose, we've run the trials, we know our fibers will blend, but on certain platforms and with certain uh, uh, attention to detail, we can run our fibers right up to 100% vast fiber content and completely eliminate the need for regenerated cellulose or uh, plastic. Awesome, thank you for that, Jason. You're um, all right. We're going to turn it over to Dr. Ching Shi Tu. Thanks, Kate. Um, let me just pull up my uh, screen here. All right. Oh, sorry. Can you guys see my uh, screen okay? Yep. All right. Okay. Thank you, Kate. Um, hello, everyone. Um, in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to uh, briefly, I should give you an overview of the key aspects we can consider when we try to evaluate the sustainability for biodegradable wipe or actually bioproducts in general. And I would like to start with this very informative uh, wheel uh, chart that Kelsey actually introduced in her presentation. And we can kind of like category all these different strategies, right? So into, for example, improving the environmental impacts of our uh, wipe product and also into the category of, for example, improving the social acceptance and um, behavior change. And we also hope that all these strategies can actually at the same time meet the economic performance goals. For example, one of them could be like achieving cost of parity, but, uh, but, but also as Franklin uh, actually introduced that they're, they're still at least at this moment, there still needs some kind of like green premium to actually bring the price to the kind of the same, same level. So that's also something we need to consider. And also in order to actually get a real, uh, like the full picture of the economic performance of uh, different white products, we need to, to also consider what's called externality that I'm gonna cover in the next slide. So that's the economic aspects. And also if we look at the social aspects, right? So we know that the, like the flushability of the white will cause some of the social impacts, but there are, are other social impacts we can consider when evaluating the sustainability of the, you know, the, the white products. And also social acceptance, behavior change. These are actually highlighted in the yellow. Uh, the strategies here are also very important aspects. And I'm gonna take a little bit into this in the, in the following presentation. And finally, we propose all those very you know, fantastic, very good innovation in technology to make it uh, a more environmentally friendly why product, right? So, but how can we actually correlate those te technical innovations with the corresponding environmental impacts is very important from a assessment pr perspective, right? So you're doing all those good work, but how can you actually correlate your work with the, the potential environmental impact? That's a very important aspect to consider when we want to look at basically the three pillars of sustainability. So I'm gonna move on to the economic aspect. So 
if we want to understand, for example, the potential of cost parity, parity or the proper amount of green premium that's needed for, for example, our biodegradable white products, one te technique we can use and actually it's widely used technique is called techno-economic analysis. So this is an example of uh, biofuels, right? So you can, in this case, you can, for example, test out different feedstocks for your for your final product. You can you can test out different combination of conversion technologies, and also you you can have different products, different co-products, final process for different use, and uh, analyze the possible like the market scenario under different policy interventions. So this particular technique allows you to actually estimate for them for the profit of a you know the biodegradable white product under a particular scenario and based on that if if for example the cost parity is not feasible as, as of now you can actually determine for example what is the proper level of green premium that's probably needed for your new product right so this is kind of like economic aspect in terms of technology but at, at the same time we also need to consider the externality which is for example in this case um, let's assume you are harvesting a forest, right? So you, you will have your internal cost, for example, rental of the machinery, paying for the license, but you, there, will, there will be some other cost that, that's actually as a consequence of your operation that is not actually like bared by you, right? For example, by removing the forest, you may actually cause, for example, the, 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 carbon, star, the carbon stock in the land and, that's, and also lead to, for, for example, some of the biodiversity um, deterioration. And all these will have consequence, will have environmental impact. And there, and there is a way to actually quantify, the monitorize that impact, and that will become the external cost to your operation. But the goal is actually try to have, get a full picture of, for example, a particular technology or particular process by internalize these external costs. And the, the one of the approach that's feasible for doing this type of analysis is, is called a life cycle costing. Right? And we will actually talk about this life cycle thinking aspect in the, in the environmental assessment uh, slide later. And there are actually this kind of example for life cycle costing already exists in, in our current world. For example, there's a concept called social, co social carbon cost and that basically kind of like monitorize the uh, impact of, a, of any of the action that leads to the environmental impact to the, to the people. And then I think the current value for the social uh, carbon costs in Canada as specified by um, Environmental and Climate Change Canada is around $40 per ton. So that's one example of kind of like monetized externality of the cost, giving you a full picture of the economic performance when you want to evaluate the sustainability of your, a particular product. And speaking of social aspect, I think, uh, Tada, you actually mentioned the social impacts of clogging, right? So there are clogging issues which, which is going to lead to, for example, the cost associated with cleaning up the mess. But actually, those social impacts are, in many cases, are actually beyond the monetary uh, impact, right? So uh, because of these, for example, this disturbance of the public water, waste treat, wastewater treatment process, uh, service, it's going to affect our daily life. And this kind of impact is actually not evenly distributed. Usually, those are like you know vulnerable community are are actually those are like income low income com, uh, like families. They are actually more rely, uh, relying on those public uh, like a utility service. So those kind of in, social impact can actually be very kind of like severe for a particularly vulnerable group of population. And we, we really want to actually quantify this kind of social impacts for, for example, for the flushable bio uh, and biodegradable uh, white products. And also, I, I think another important thing to consider when you evaluate, evaluate the sustainability of a white product is also the social ac acceptance, right? If we look at social acceptance, there are actually three dimensions. The first one is more on to like at the top, the general level, like a social politic uh, political acceptance is just like a, if you ask a, ask a person um, ask a people like saying that um, what do you think about like a biodegradable wipe I think is it the majority answer you get is like uh, will be like okay so it's a better product than a plastic wipe right so that's actually a very high level first step social acceptance 
And then we really go down to the local level, for example, in a certain regions, in a certain community, then there's actually the issue of like not in my backyard type of uh, reaction is gonna happen. So you really need to work with the local community to understand their culture, their like a, their pattern of consumption to make sure that actually th this part of like a localized acceptance is actually gained. And at the same time, um, the market acceptance are, are also kind of like local. In fact, you need to actually uh, kind of like win the confidence on the investors because they actually understand that you will actually gain the acceptance from the community in this particular area. So this is like a three dimension of social acceptance that you need to consider when you do a sustainability assessment for a like bioproduct. And once we have the social acceptance, the actually the final step is leading to the behavior change, right? So all the, all the, all these are like a very wonderful work we've ever done to actually pr uh, produce this for example, environmentally friendly, flushable product, we need to actually to, to do this final kick. So, so make sure that people actually use the proper way that actually deliver uh, the ex expected um, the impact we want to make, right? So this is a study, a very interesting study looking at the uh, com compostable biodegradable plastic bottle. If you look at it left apart of this figure, it's very clear that people have this ac acceptance they know that a compostable, biodegradable, bio-based plastic bottle is better. So we have this agreement. And then on the right, you will see the actual behavior. People don't really actually treat this compostable, biodegradable bottle in the correct way. So there is a disconnection, right? So how can we actually bring a behavior change to actually deliver the, the sustainability, um, the benefit we want to we actually expect, right? So that's a very important uh, thing that actually, that should be incorporated at the, at the beginning of the design of a product. Uh, and there's a one very good example is if you think about the aluminum beverage can, like before 2000, if you remember the, the tap of those cans, you have to completely peel them off uh, uh, before you can actually drink the soda, right? But now the modern design is it, it becomes part of the can. So in this case, you, you implicitly change customer behavior. They don't actually throw away the, the tab anymore. It, it becomes part of, part of the can, so they actually can recycle the whole thing. So that's a very ingenious design at the very beginning. So that's also something we need to evaluate the product, right? So are you actually designed in a way that actually can potentially change the behavior of your customer? So that's um, the kind of like detailed and social aspect. And um, for the environmental impact, I will dig a little bit more into this and give you a kind of like quantitative example of how and what we need to consider in terms of um, environmental impact and assessment. So, so I think uh, for actually for any of the assessment product uh, problem, the, the definition of the problem is actually very important. For example, we know that we have the biodegradable wipe with maybe more or less different like uh, technical property as compared to, for example, the benchmark, then when we compare the two products, we need to make sure that we actually compare them at the same application because maybe in one application, we can use less sheets of the you know, biodegradable product as compared to the benchmark, but in other application, we may have to use more, just really depending on the application. And that's gonna affect our uh, impact assessment result, right? So understand what are the applications are a very important first step, and also think about what really is going to go into part of the uh, functionality. For example, how do we think flexibility uh, is a function part of the functionality? I would think uh, that's kind of like of a measurement. Because if you think flexibility is part of functionality, then you will basically rule out all these non-flexible products for comparison, right? So these are kind of like a, the nitty gritty of starting uh, the problem that you want to uh, investigate for the environmental impact assessment. And also once once you finish kind of like define the functionality of the product to, to, to compare with, the next step is to actually develop a quantifiable matrix. So we are familiar with for example, uh, climate change, right? So global warming potential is a well-established matrix that people actually use. But what about clogging? Clogging is actually a very important aspect for the, for the white products, right? So how do we quantify the environment impact of clogging? Uh, clogging, are we, talking about like water quality change? Are we talking, how can we actually some, somewhat link 
the clouding impact to the climate change, right? So this is something we need to think about. And also biodegradability, because we can measure this in the lab for the pure products under certain condition. But in real life, we are actually talking about a mixture of materials in a variety of conditions. Can we come up with a like a generic matrix and a, and a calculation method for the uh, for the assessment so we can actually compare a large group of products? Right? Those are those are the questions that's related to the problem definition. And then after we define a problem, then we can actually develop, develop the assessment approach. And I think many of us are familiar with life cycle assessment because it's actually a very widely used tool to actually get a comprehensive understanding of the environmental impact of a product. So if we look at the assessment pipeline, we have the problem defined, and we know we want to use this particular approach. And the, the, the missing piece is actually data, right? So that's actually the most important thing. And why it's relevant is because if you think about the bio-based products, in many cases, they're at what we'll call the low, uh, like the TRL technology readiness level. So that's actually usually at TRL4 but our benchmark are usually at TR9, right? So if, if we want to compare fairly between two products, you really need to know what is the possible environmental impact when the, this particular new technology is scaled up. And in many cases that matters because the way you um, design your product at a very early stage is gonna have, you, have a, like a really heavy impact on the environmental impact in the end when you have the product. So, um, here I will quickly go through an example, which is a recent collaboration with my uh, co-authors on basically an alternative way of bu uh, producing lactic acid from glycerin using a, a electrocatalysis process. And uh, for those who are actually working in lab, I guess that's what usually what you have, right? So when you develop a technology, you have a data sheet where basically you have, um, let's say, um, like a set of data where you see that there's your uh, products and co-products and you have, oh, sorry. and you also have the data for the re uh, re reactants that, that goes into a reaction and you know that that's your experimental condition, right? That's pro pro uh, probably the best you can get. But if we think about the, the actual pr production of the product at a large scale, you, re you really need to know like what, what happens not only when you are making the products, but also when you are actually purifying your products, which is usually you don't you don't do in the lab. Right? So so in this case, we really need to take this information, use like a domain specific technology and uh, the model to get the information about, for example, utility use, material waste generation, also in some in some time like the reactor sizing to help us to understand the overall environmental impact. Okay, so uh, I'm going to quickly go through the result because the result itself is not really quite relevant here. But the, this um, donut chart actually shows that the contribution of the major life cycle stages, right? So we, we see that feedstock in this case has a largest impact. But if you think about it as a producer, um, feedstock is probably, you have less control on, right? So it, then if you think about your developing technology, the process energy consumption, you have more control on this. So this actually gives you the idea through life cycle assessment to tell you actually that's a place where you can actually further improve. Um, for a technology, and also we can use this data to kind of like do a bottom-up approach to scale up and see the impact if we compare this new technology as the conventional technology, how that's going to affect the whole lactic acid industry in the United States in this case. So um, just quickly to wrap up my presentation, I think the first message I want to kind of like deliver is that we, when, you talk, when we think about economic performance, we really need to think about full economic value, right? So not only just the technical related cost, but also the externality that's actually from the use of the product. And also we know that social acceptance and the behavior change is kind of like the final kick uh, to, to actually deliver what we expect. And also we see that life cycle assessment is actually a very useful tool for us to understand uh, the environmental impact and help to identify the hotspot for future improvement. Okay, sorry. Um, just quickly ra rush through this. Um, yep, yeah, I would give it back to Kate. Uh, thank you, King Chi. I, I yep. do appreciate that we're trying to keep on time here. So we have about 15 minutes left, and there are a lot of awesome questions I want to get to. Um, so I said, I guess I'll start um, directing one question at Ching Shi, but then after you, you answer that, we'll open it up to the other okay. panelists as well. 
Um, so I'm going to ask you the top question here from E. Kumbaros, which says, with respect to the EU SUPD, we are seeing political agendas outweigh the scientific and technical reasonings behind sustainability and plastic fibers, regardless of any industry or expert inputs. How do we, as an industry, influence policies, policies like this positively and based in science? Well, that's actually a very, very uh, profound question. That's a very big, big question. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's very relevant. And especially if you now see a lot of the, um, like, uh, I would say the marketing by the company or by those consulting reports, I think the, the keyword they use is like science-based, um, like, uh, like a policy. Right, they, they are trying to try to drive. So there is a place for uh, academic research, like for example, if you do a life cycle assessment, and get that incorporated into one of uh, like one of the like a political campaign. So there are. Um, so I think we look at this from both ways. One is that there are opportunities, more and more opportunity to incorporate those things, uh, the scientific research into um, like political campaign. But as you also said, that there is uh, other. On the other side, people are actually kind of utilize this so-called not, not not actually not very regular scientific results to actually push the political agenda. So both side of the, uh, like the story are happening, and uh, I think what we can do now is really to publish um, the make it like open access, publish our results, and make it as transparent as possible, so more people can actually see that, and we can actually hopefully use that to influence some of the, um, you know, policy decisions. Thank you for that answer, Ching Shi. Um, are there any other panelists who wanted to try and answer that question or add to Ching Shi's comments? I just wanted to say that this is an extremely important topic. And I think there is a mandate for uh, industry and universities actually to reach to government and decision makers. Think about the decisions that are being taken in the European Union with the European Union uh, plastic directive for single use plastics, right? Uh, this is coming along now very rapidly and it's evolving very rapidly. And before we know those directives will impact the market landscape and can affect in a positive or a negative way, for instance, uh, cellulose producers or otherwise. So this is really, really important. Just wanted to, to, to highlight that fact. This is uh, very super important uh, and, and a very important function of institutes like ours, but also of course, uh, industry and academia. Um, may I add to, uh, I think that also industry uh, gotta play smart because uh, I feel like sometimes there is uh, not a, a connection in, in, for instance, like research and, and how we communicate that effectively. So this is where I believe like industry should play smart and, and should partner with, for instance, consumers. Um, in, in trying to and, and have them ultimately uh, conveying the, the message to the to the the, the other stakeholders because if we uh, think in the the last big changes that have happened the past three years have come from big movement in for instance social media or this type of, of channels so that's another another aspect to 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 consider as well. Yes, indeed. Thank you all for your answers to that question. Um, I guess I my next question, I would like to pass it on to Jason. I know there was a question you wanted to address from the chat. Were you able to uh, pull yes. that up or did you want me to read it? Um, no, I can read it if you like. <clears throat> um, do you have development for the disinfecting wet wipes? Uh, cellulose components usually decrease the concentration of the active ingredients and thus reduce shelf life of the product. So industries use all synthetic fibers, completely true. And it's a big need for the industry, absolutely. So <clears throat> our company, uh, we, 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 we engineer solutions for these fibers because while they, have, they answer a lot of questions and they answer a lot of unmet needs, they still do have some limitations. And, the, and what um, Hassan is, is referring to here is uh, something called quat binding. And in disinfecting, quaternary ammonium compounds are the standard disinfectant that are used in hospitals, food service, and a wide variety of industries. But they're not compatible with cellulose, uh, natural cellulose. They bind together and the quat becomes completely neutralized. So part that I didn't go through in my presentation is that we, we've engineered solutions to a number of different issues, um, created a fairly robust patent suite and uh, intellectual property suite. And one of them is around quat binding. 
And we've developed a way to protect our fibers from quat uh, to a point that they rival the, and they actually exceed the performance of synthetic based wipes uh, in quat um, use. So there's no binding. Uh, the fibers are still completely natural, biodegradable. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a treatment that is pretty effective. Um, that is, is a, a brand we refer to as Noval. And uh, um, we have run through numerous independent tests that show that our, our shelf life is well over one year with complete quat compatibility. Uh, so it really is a, a first for the market for a completely natural cellulose to be completely quat compatible. Okay, good to know. Thanks, Jason. Um, I'll take another question here. Maybe I'll direct it towards Franklin. Um, so we had a question from Rob that says, since most consumers don't know wipes contain plastic and the manufacturers have gone to great lengths to keep that from them, how do you deliver this message in the first place? You're on mute, Franklin, sorry. Yeah, uh, I think that the fact that they're already uh some products on the on the shelf that are being advertised as being like a uh, uh, sustainable, like uh, free of plastic or, or some sort of thing. It's, it's trying to create an awareness. Like consumers are are like uh, become more aware that there is something, there is an issue or something going on with a regular watch, and I that's a uh, reason why uh, major uh, companies, major players, have been somehow like uh, pushed to start. Uh, also putting labels on the products and saying that those are plastic free. So I think that somehow this whole issue is, is being like uncovered and then uh, major uh, players are adapting to 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 uh, to, to be at the same level that than the the, the sustainable uh, options. Yep, I would agree with that, Franklin. The uh, uh, in our experience, the consumer awareness of the plastic content of wipes is not high but it is increasing. And so as we look at microplastic contamination that, that people are now reporting coming from clothing and in the washing machine, the brands out there, the, the large global uh, consumer brands have certainly recognized the fact that their wipes are made from plastic and now they're starting to advertise when they're not made from plastic. And I believe that the, uh, you know, this is catching on with consumers. We have a significant number of brands come to us looking for plastic free alternatives. So this is catching on and it, it's coming I think it's coming from various parts of the industry and from other outside industries uh, as well to raise this awareness. Yeah, so or I guess Orlando touched a bit on the EU single use plastics directive, but we have another question here from uh, Yuka Hassanen. Um, so talking about the EU single, single use plastic directive and the definition of plastic, um, it's counterproductive in many ways. Political agendas are outweighing scientific reasoning are in some ways contradictory to common sense. Of course, SUPD only bans several single use products. However, if the same plastic definition is applied to future legislation regarding, for example, packaging or textiles, there is a risk of losing the opportunity to utilize bio-based materials. Um, how do we ensure that this will not happen in Europe or globally? Hey, Juka, thank you for staying awake. This is so late in Finland, so great, great to hear you. Yeah, so th this highlights the fact that we need to be involved in decision making. I mean, uh, uh, the current definitions would make uh, some cellulose, after some minor modification, classify as a plastic, and that will prevent entry in the marketplace. So this is super important for us. Those that are working with cellulose, with fibers, even uh, you know, if there is, there is a minor modification, there is a risk that the classification will prevent those uh, materials to, to, to be utilized. And, and there is, of course, uh, a number of uh, aspects to this. Uh, but in general, we need to be very aware that, uh, again, industry and, um, and, um, uh, and academia should be involved in this process, definitely. And I haven't seen that too strongly, at least from academia point of view. I think this very important that we get involved in the decision making here. Thanks, Orlando. Um, anyone else want to add on that? I guess maybe I, I could ask Jason how how do you think that's affecting your your company and kind of the opportunities? Absolutely, and I totally understand the question. Um, 
And, you know, as of right now with Viscos being under that with the modifications and under, uh, under the guidance of the single use plastic, I understand the, the issue for our company. And I think for the industry as a whole, it certainly is highlighting the issue of plastics and non-woven. So I think as, a, as an umbrella, the, the single use plastic, it's, it's a positive thing. And I think that um, to move the conversation away from plastic and towards more sustainable alternatives is absolutely important. Um, we have certainly uh, been trying to take an active role in the uh, uh, guidance and the creation of guidelines in under this uh, single use plastic record. It is difficult, um, especially being here based in Canada. Um, we do have operations in Germany. So we are, we do have a department in, in our company now for outreach and global outreach uh, so that we can help influence these things. But I, I, I agree with you, Orlando, that business is working with academia so that we can go and, and help, uh, you know, encourage the adoption of logical legislation uh, makes a lot of sense and and we are proponents of that and I think it's uh, it would be very difficult for the industry if if plastic is is removed from being able to be used and then viscose as well um, that has a that would have a, a very detrimental effect on the on the entire non-woven industry because there's not much less uh, left I'd love to say we could fill all that volume but that's not yet give, give me five years all right, well, we'll be watching the market reports in five years then. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. Um, I wanted to direct a question to Ching Shi um, that's from Richard at BPI. It says, with LCA being impacted so much by the end of life, in practice, how do we ensure that companies complete this analysis correctly and report on it in a transparent way? Thank you, Kate, and thank you, Richard. Uh, I'm actually typing the answer. <laughs> But yeah, so uh, basically one way to do it is through EPD, right? Environmental Product Declar Declaration. So this, uh, we have a lot of um, product categories already have the rule, EPD rules. For example, you can have like, uh, you know, cons constru construction materials, like, uh, you know, concrete and all these, uh, like, for example, mass, uh, like uh, CLT and all these construction materials, they have their own, um, like EPD, like PCR. So product uh, category rules for you to actually do properly ALCA in a transparent way. Although obviously transparency is not as, um, uh, uh, not there yet, uh, as I would say from a LCA uh, like a pra pra practitioner perspective, but it's, a, it's an important first step. And so through the EPD system, you will basically are, uh, the, the company are required to do a, do a LCA and get an audit by the specific like certified uh, like third party organizations to aud audit their LCA results and make sure it's done properly. And then by the, and they will then kind of like release it in, in public and then people know that this is the environmental impact of their product. So that's, that is one way in a kind of like already well established system for, for people actually to kind of like promote their bio-based product. Great, thank you, Ching Chi. I don't want to interrupt anyone and I would like to get to all of the questions, but unfortunately it is exactly 2.30 right now. Um, so we need to wrap it up here. Um, I just wanted to thank all of the panelists. I guess if you have any final comments, we can do that as well, but I see people dropping off here. So thank you everyone for attending today. Um, it was very exciting presentations. We, I think it's clear that the industry as well as the consumers are, are ready for this change. Um, we just need to figure out ways to work together. So um, if you have any more questions, please contact us at BPI or you can saw the contact information for all the panelists today. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll turn it, it's after 2.30, but if people still have a few minutes, I'll turn it over to the panelists to have some closing remarks. Sure, I'll jump in first. <laughs> um, thank you very much for the opportunity once again to speak. I think that this is a very timely, uh, topic and I believe that the answers are within our grasp and that the uh, our ability to change this industry and answer those consumer demands is at hand and uh, we're looking forward to being part of the solution. Thanks, a, comment, a comment very quickly on my behalf and behalf of the Bioproducts Institute is that initiatives like the Border Alliance that we're starting to implement with uh, Finland then Sweden as well. I think this is very important because uh, the Pressure is already global, it's not local. So we need to find partnerships. The other one that is going on is with North Carolina State University. VPI is partnering to 
to look into uh, non-wood fibers, uh, utilization of non-wood non fibers. So this is a, a classical example of what we're discussing today. So this type of uh, cross-border uh, partnerships are super important for all of us. And finally, one comment, Kate, the, just to mention that this uh, webinar is being recorded and will be posted in, in YouTube channels in BPI for all to yes, watch. Thank you, Orlando. I guess since we're on the topic of BPI, I see that Richard has his hands up here. So I'm just going to um, open the floor to Richard if you wanted to have a comment. No, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I clicked on the button accidentally, but I, I certainly would be happy to say thanks everybody for the for the talk. I was trying to applaud actually. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, but anyway, great great discussion. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Richard. Um, Ching Chi or Franklin, do you have anything last words? Well, I just want to thank you everybody. Uh, like thank. Thank, uh, thank actually Orlando and Kate and all your team members to actually organize this very wonderful discussion and really enjoy the discussion from my uh, peer panelists. And I'm happy to actually share some of the uh, like the assessment aspect of the sustainability for bioproducts. So really appreciate this. Thank you. I also want to share, uh, thank for the opportunity. I really, I think that these venues are nice to to kind of envision and be for a moment like in the in the future so i think it's it's very productive and and hope that uh something good it's is uh comes ahead of us thank you fantastic thank you franklin and thanks everyone um sorry for keeping you over time i hope everyone has a great afternoon bye-bye thank you everybody <laughs> <laughs>